Welcome to another edition of the Story Geeks. I know that they've been a little bit too few and far between, but we're getting back into it here, so you'll have to forgive us for that. Uh, tonight, we are talking about Inside Out 2. And is it a return to brilliance for Pixar, or is Pixar still struggling through some things? We'll get to that and a lot more. We've got an awesome panel here. In the meantime, OG, hit it. Well, uh, we are going to talk about Inside Out 2. Inside Out 2 is now on Disney+. Plus. So if you haven't seen it yet, we're going to get into spoilers. So definitely, you know, come back to it. Uh, come back to this show after you've seen Inside Out 2. But a lot of people saw Inside Out 2 because it made a lot of money. <laughs> so we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, but I have a great panel of folks that are joining me today. Uh, the godfather of the show himself, Orange Grove 55. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. It's an honor. I, I'm glad we're getting back into these story geeks. I, I miss doing these shows. A lot of fun. Um, yeah, I, I actually just watched this movie last night. Mm. And I absolutely, I don't want to give away any spoilers or anything, but I absolutely <laughs> fell in love with it. It was, I thought it was amazing. But we'll get into the details. But uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to talk shop with uh, you, Josh, and and Megan. Um, you can find me on social media. I'm kind of I'm kind of um, weaning myself off of, uh, of X. I'm, I'm I'm migrating to other platforms. So you can find me on Instagram, Orange Grove 55. You can even find me on Blue Sky now, which actually is a pretty good app. I'm really digging it. Um, you can also find me over there at Blue Sky at Orange Grove 55. Thank you, Jay. Nice. Yeah, go, go follow OG over there. He'll have a lot of updates for you and thoughts about where Avatar should go <laughs> in the parks. This is, <laughs> this is what this man is about. This is what this man is about. Um, yes. It is also an absolute pleasure to have Megan Salinas back on the show. Megan okay. um, is one of the oldest story geeks guests of all time. And I don't mean, I don't mean age wise. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> veteran brings a lot to the table. Great to have with us. Megan, welcome to the show. It's so nice to be back. Uh, I think last time, we were talking about Star Wars, so it's nice to be on. I think this might be the first time um, ever talking about anything outside of Star Wars animated on on this channel, uh, since normally uh, my bread and butter is all the spooky stuff. So it's, I'm really excited, and I actually put off, like, please don't judge me too hard, I actually put off watching the original Inside Out for years mm -hmm. because I knew it was going to make me cry. <laughs> and <laughs> so I actually avoided it uh, for, for a good long while because I was like, I don't need to cry this weekend. Um, but when you invited me to come on to talk about uh, Inside Out 2, that was finally the push I needed to watch both movies. Oh, so you and saw I, both of them so in the last couple of weeks? I, oh, wow. I watched them back to back on a double feature this weekend. Uh, and I got to tell you, I am so, so glad that I did. So thank you, Jay, for, for getting me to finally like move past my fear emotion and uh, jump in so that I could embrace <laughs> sadness. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool. By the way, uh, if you want to hear some of Megan's voice work, she is one of the voice actors in our full cast audiobook of Death of a Bounty Hunter. So just so you know, you can go check Megan out there too. Where, where else you know, can people find you, Megan? Things yeah, it's still one of the coolest things I've ever gotten to do. So thank oh, you that's again. amazing. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, that's super cool. And she does such uh, a great job in it, too. Oh, stop. Oh, you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you guys can find me. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called Silver Screams, where me and my uh, my roommate, we talk about horror things on occasion. Uh, but you guys can also find me on Instagram, at the Menguin, and also on Twitter, at the Menguin. But uh, yeah, I, I'm with you, Orange Grove. I think I might start moseying like homer simpson into the hedges like <laughs> away from from twitter slowly but surely but we'll see nice nice now is megwin is that a play on your name and penguin uh it is uh, uh a buddy of mine um one day uh she gave me the nickname uh uh, basically, she got overly excited when trying to show me a penguin plushie, and so she combined the the words Megan and penguin, and uh, the nickname just stuck. And so, <laughs> it's uh, I still go by the penguin. It's absolutely brilliant. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely brilliant. It was, it was a complete and total accident, but it's a beautiful accident. I'm so glad that, that I'm so glad the name has stuck around. Absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, if you need, if you need a breath of fresh air, as you can tell, Megan is a super positive person. Go follow her for sure. And then that leads me to the last but not least person to join this podcast. One of my best friends, Joshua Taylor. How are you, sir? Hey, one of my best friends. <laughs> uh, I'm doing really well. I, uh, for people who don't know, I moved, so I don't have the, the background that I used to. I'm kind of in transition in life, uh, but things are going re- really well. I've been recently uh, deep diving into a ton of different films. Uh, I've been, oh, for a long time, I've been working my way through the AFI 100, mm. but kind of uh, really kickstarted that into full gear the past couple of weeks. So a couple of months, really. Uh, so I've been watching a ton of classic films. I'm also a huge horror fan, uh, like Megs is. So, um, you know, I bring that to the table. And on Modern Mouse, I talk all the time about animation. Mm-hmm. So animation is uh, right in my wheelhouse. Yeah. And it's really cool that Josh can join us, too, because um, I, we talked about this doing this show a couple weeks back because OG has this long list of films that he's supposed to watch. We were supposed to do a whole series on Deadpool, but none of us could get around to doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right, fine. Well, we'll get to the next one. But but OG goes, I'm actually going to watch a movie. <laughs> so we got to talk about it. So I talked to Megan and Megan's like, yeah, I can do it. That, that sounds great. And we were supposed to have George with us tonight, but George has a migraine. So George, we hope you're feeling better. Um, and, I, and I go, the next person on my list of people to ask about animation is Josh Taylor. So I had to bring Josh Taylor into the mix. I'm here. Had to do it. Had to do it. Let's so go. fortunately he was available. So very cool. Um, so let's jump into, by the way, you can't really find me on social media. I mean, you can find me on Instagram, but I'm, I'm trying to stay away from X entirely, dude. I'm yeah, we're not. All, we're all yeah. 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 We're all just, we're all doing that. I don't know about this blue sky thing. I don't know if I need that in my life or not, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's all fun and games now until it gets bigger. Then it's X all over again. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, as soon as, as soon as one of the powers that be takes it over and says, this is what it's, this is going to be my now personal messaging <laughs> website. Um, that's what happens these days. Uh, so let's talk about inside out too. This is a, um, I'm super glad, uh, Megan, that you watched both of them in a row because, uh, Inside Out 2, I think for a lot of people, was a very meaningful film. In fact, I've heard people talk about the fact that they can now communicate about their own emotions, but also teach their kids about their emotions and how they're feeling because of um, what was done with Inside Out. And Inside Out came at a time when Pixar was sort of on a roll. I mean, everything Pixar was doing was amazing. Um, that has sort of it's wavered a little bit here and there uh, more recently, it, depending on who you ask. There's a bunch of people that still love what Pixar does. Um, and then they came out with Inside Out 2 this year, which was, I mean, even if you didn't like it, it was an absolute banger for Disney or Pixar because it made, what, $1.6 billion, I believe? Something up yeah. north of that? Yeah. It's one of the few films that's made over a billion this year. Yeah, in fact... It's kind of weird to contrast it with Deadpool and Wolverine, which made over a billion. But I believe it made more than Deadpool and Wolverine made, if I'm not mistaken, right? I think so. I think you're yeah. right. I want to say Deadpool and Wolverine was around the 1.2 billion kind of range, but um, this was up higher than that, which is phenomenal. So good for good for everybody over at Pixar. Phenomenal stuff. Um, let me do a little bit of a setup here of some of the things that have changed since the first film. So, for, so we'll just go really quickly into a little bit of history of the first film. There were five emotions. Uh, let's see if I can name them all. Joy, sadness, um, disgust. Uh, what's the purple guy's name? Fear. 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 Uh, and anger. And anger, of course, I got to remember anger. Anger is like the uh, every time I think of anger, I actually think of the um, the hot dog stand in DCA <laughs> that has the giant anger um, thing. I, I just see him. I just see that the, the anger character being like, "Can't you see him walking here? Huh? Can't you see him walking <laughs> yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. You know, in New exactly. York, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of perfect. So in that in that film, it was really uh, a, a story about. Um, somebody, the, the actual character of Riley as a young woman or really a young girl dealing with moving from one city to another and all of the different emotions that produces, um, and these other two characters, which are emotions in her head, joy and sadness and joy's inability to see sadness as a positive emotion and therefore wanted to push sadness out of the way. 
Um, and so we we kind of got this really interesting film about how sadness is a core component of our um, emotional framework and how it can be expressed. Fast forward to, into this film, we added a few things, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we added some emotions, which we'll get to in a minute. But we also we also got a more a clearer picture of uh, the emotions. Riley's emotions have started understanding kind of how everything impacts her behavior, her personality, and what happens. And so we, I thought this was a really interesting setup. They actually talk about how the memories that happen uh, build the personality islands, which I thought was really fascinating, and then also build something new that wasn't in the previous film, and that was a belief system, right? So what does Riley believe? And it's this, this idea that memories kind of shape those things. We also get uh, four new emotions. We get anxiety. We get envy, we get embarrassment, and we get ennui, uh, which is a fantastic <laughs> character, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, really so, okay, not to interrupt you or anything, but it's yeah. amazing how, like when you're, when you're talking about belief systems and things yeah. like that, right? It's amazing how cerebral and how adult some of the stuff is for this family movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, they dive in. I mean, they. it's still very much for kids. I mean, y your kid can go to it for sure. Yeah. But there's a lot of messaging and t like the tone of this whole thing is like, as an adult, you can you can walk away kind of learning a lot about yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah you really can. Right. You can actually describe. You can actually start to have a language for describing what it is you're feeling, how you're feeling it, how those things are mixing together. You know, I feel a little bit of anger, but I also feel a little bit of ennui. Um, Megan, I'm going to start with you because you've just seen both films, <laughs> and that's a very special thing to kind of go through. Um, what is your take on these two films? Give us like a scale of one to 10. How impactful were they for you? Like, just talk to me about what your experience was watching them. Oh, I don't know if I can give like a, a like because of recency bias, I, I might just be like, oh yeah, 10 out of 10. They're amazing. <laughs> um, but uh, they, they are both incredible, wonderful movies uh, and wonderfully imaginative uh, and both of them are also incredibly charming. All of the characters are really fun. And like you guys have already touched on, that they they act as a really fun way to be able to teach kids about processing their own emotions. And in some cases, even some adults. Um, and the, the visual metaphors that they use, and let's be honest, a lot of the visual puns as well are also like, key in making this movie as abs an absolutely adorable romp. Uh, and so I had a really good time. I did definitely cry <laughs> <laughs> in both. Um, and I think they are remarkably effective at what they're both trying to do, which is tap into an emotional experience that everyone can relate to. Everybody, regardless of your background or where you come from, um, everybody having grown up like knows what it's like to feel sadness and to feel the combination of emotions as tied in with your memories. And so it's something that regardless of what you've gone through in life, you can relate to what Riley is experiencing and feeling in both of these movies. Uh, if I were to be nitpicky, which I feel like we can probably be a little nitpicky. Of course, uh, yeah, it's a story yeah. show. We got to break it down. I do feel like two is a little bit, maybe a little bit too much of mm. a retread of mm. the first one. Although I do like a lot of the new ideas that it incorporates, like the belief system. Uh, and of course, the character of anxiety. I don't think it necessarily gives all of the characters as much to do as it mm. could like we have this slew of new emotions but really the only one that gets real focus is anxiety uh and it doesn't necessarily also you like it doesn't present any of the positives that anxiety can provide mm. uh granted uh like I, I, I do th think that they were exceedingly effective in what they were trying to do, just in terms of being able to get people to understand the way anxieties can, anxiety can impact people. So I think they were effective, but um, I do think that they could have taken a little bit of a different approach rather than retreading 
a lot of the same plot beats that the first mm-hmm. movie went through. Uh, and having Joy learn the exact same lesson of, oh, maybe we shouldn't suppress those those bad thoughts and those bad emotions. Maybe mm-hmm. that those could actually be good for Riley in some capacity. So I really did enjoy both, but I I'm a little bit worried just from a meta perspective that um, with Pixar's shifting focus in the future, you know, they they set, stated that they're more interested in making things like Inside Out 2 rather than focusing on creating new IP. Mm-hmm. And to me, that is a little worrisome. Mm-hmm. Uh, as much as I enjoyed Inside Out 2, and I think it was a great time, and I definitely cried. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it's still got that Pixar magic in it. But I really worry that IP will come at the expense of original storytelling. And I don't like the idea of Pixar heading in that direction. So I've got yeah. some mixed feelings myself. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I want to come back to that, actually, because that's a really interesting thing to talk about from uh, the future of animation um, and the future of filmmaking. Um, Josh, before we get to that, I do want to hear what your thoughts were on Inside Out 2. And the way I'm going to ask you this question is because Josh on his channel Mm. Um, is creating a list of the is it 100 the top 100 yes yeah top 100 animated films do either of these films make it into the top 10 do either of them make it, do both of them make it into the top 25 mm. hit me with what you think is uh, going to happen I there i i'm not 100 percent sure so for anybody watching um i think i've gone through like four or five films so i'm just starting this list but the goal is to watch uh, every two weeks to watch a, a new film, add it to the list, and try and create an ongoing list. So, like, even past the 100 mark, I'll be continuing to watch films, knock some off the list, put some new ones on. It'll be an ever growing kind of beast. I, I could see the first one definitely joining the list. Hmm. In the top 25, is going to be difficult. In the top 50, maybe. Hmm. Uh, I think one of the great things about the first film is they really struck gold in the same way that Toy Story did. What I mean by that is that we are supposed to see ourselves in Andy. I know that Woody and Buzz are kind of the main characters of Toy Story, but we, you know, are realistically Andy. By the time we get to the third film, you know, you're supposed to have that moment of emotional release in terms of. Andy's letting go of his toys. He's growing up. He's moving on with his life in the same way that, especially for me as somebody who saw the original film when I was maybe 11 or so, 10, 11, um, you know, getting to an age where I was maybe like 23, 24, when the third film came out, I was like, oh, this is really speaking to me. I think that a lot of people connect with Inside Out, not because of all of the emotions, but because they see themselves as Riley. Whether you're an adult or a kid, it is explaining how your brain works. And you go yeah. like, oh, I've experienced this. Oh, I remember that day when this memory happened and it was both sad and happy or whatever the case might be, right? Um, I do kind of have the same feelings that Megan has is even the even Inside Out 2 feels like we're teetering into Toy Story 4 territory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do love Toy Story 4, it's grown on me, but it does feel like an unnecessary sequel. I do like some of the new characters, but it doesn't feel like because we've added such a large cast, people get enough screen time to really warrant um, the whole thing. Um, That said, I did really enjoy Inside Out 2, but I fear that what Disney will see is that Inside Out 2 did really well people loved it but i think the reason why inside out 2 did really well is because inside out 1 is such a spectacular film people wanted to go see those characters again no matter what the case it could have been the worst movie in the world people still would have signed up because they're revisiting those characters from such a spectacular film Mm. yeah yeah i can see i can see both of your your points on that um so so og this is this is a movie that you got off your list, so you were you were excited to see this yes. one. Um, yeah. What give me give me sort of your feeling for the first film, and then give me what how that's changed now having seen the second film. 
See, I kind of depart a little bit from Josh and Meg Meg Megan on this. I actually feel this one did. I can see where it, it feels similar, but I feel like this sequel definitely dipped into some older themes, which is good because she's aging. You know, Riley is aging, so I definitely feel there is a difference. Yes, there are emotions, and yes, it's it's kind of the same thing where she's where they're trying to not they're trying to figure out how these emotions kind of fit together right like in the first film mm -hmm. but i still feel because riley is older and because these new emotions are are, are, are for a much more mature young lady i feel like that, that's enough for me personally that's enough difference where i feel like this 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 movie is set apart from the first one enough for me because mm -hmm. we're dealing with very very different kind of problems for riley in this film you know what i'm saying so um in terms of uh, i gotta say like this film really hit me because i've been i've been suffering with anxiety disorder since i was like 16 like and like bad like i get symptoms like physical symptoms you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and I was um, it, it, it's something like 20 or 25 percent of americans sorry to anybody else outside of america but it's a it's a large percentage of people that do suffer from some sort of anxiety disorder I don't personally. So for me, it doesn't, right, it doesn't connect in the same way that it might for you in that regard. Although I've had anxiety attacks, but in that way I've felt it, but not to that degree. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. I've, I've had it bad for pretty much my whole life. And so it was kind of, it kind of hit close to home. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everything, even down to like the catastrophizing when anxiety takes over the imagination and they're coming up with all these worst case scenarios. I'm like, Oh my God. Like it, it, this was like based on my life. You know what I'm saying? My brain, like that's what my brain does. You know what I'm saying? I, with, with anxiety, that's what I do. So I think when it comes to like the themes in this movie with anxiety, this new character, I feel, and that's why I, maybe I loved it as much as I did. Maybe there is a little bit of a bias there, but I do, I just loved how they tackled that. And it was done in such a creative way. And I love the, the idea of how they have to like, like they understand that anxiety is important, right? You need anxiety in life. It's an emotion that you need, you know, fight or flight, right? It, it does have a role, but you have to learn how to balance that. You can't have the, the it, 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 it's overwhelming everything, you know what I'm saying? And you kind of learn that at the end. I, I just, I just fell in love with this movie. Um, I really like how they also, um, oh, what's the word for it? I'm trying to, I'm trying to catch what, what I'm trying to say here. Um, I really, I really like how they, um, played with the belief systems, how the memories play into all of that. I think that was very important. Um, my only criticism, honestly, in this film would be, uh, I feel like embarrassment didn't get enough airtime. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought he was a great character and I, I wish he would have got a little bit more. But yeah, overall, I love this movie. I love the messaging in it. Um, I think for people that do have anxiety, I think that you can kind of glean a lot from this movie and learn a lot from this movie. Um, just... Overall, a really good time with it. You know, I, it's probably honestly one of my favorite Pixar movies, to be honest with you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it I, ranks high up there for me. I, I'm for just to bounce off of what you were saying. I loved that the central conflict in this one was um, essentially trying to preserve Riley's sense of self. Mm. Um, and, you know, the the only we gave a spoiler at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. Um, I, I love that the only way she can regain her sense of self and become self-actualized as a person is by confronting all of the bad memories that she's been pushing to the back of her mind. Yes. Like only when those come back to the surface and get properly confronted and all of the emotions come together. Like that that's an exceedingly yeah. moving uh, and, and meaningful ending for a movie where Overall, I feel like it's a little bit of a retread, but that is a stellar way to end. Hmm. That last scene when all, yeah, you're right, man. When, when, when all the emotions are hugging and anxiety was the last one to walk over and give them a big hug. I was like, oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> I was like, I, that, I, might, it was, I might start crying again. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it really is a beautiful moment. And, and Meg, you also bring up, Megan, you also bring up the, um, the visual metaphors. And that was something I really picked up on or the puns. Um, they were done in such a 
they were definitely puns, right? But they were done in a way where like sarcasm. Yeah, sarcasm. It was so brilliantly handled. Or they're flying on that on that balloon, right? And they're going through a storm and they're like, oh no, a brainstorm. I'm like, oh my gosh, like how brilliant <laughs> is this? You know what I'm saying? And then even to the when when anxiety um puts all the emotions in that little jar, right? Mm bottling up your emotions right mm -hmm. it's a visual like it just every, i just love these little creative things but it's not for so it doesn't feel like oh ha 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 funny joke that it, it makes sense these are all things that we we've said a million times bottling up your emotions i'm brainstorming you know and it just it works so so well and so organically in this film i just i think it's brilliant absolutely brilliant the sarcasm bit is hilarious too. I mean, the, like, at first you're like, okay, sarcasm. And they, they even make fun of it themselves, right? Because disgust is like, are you serious, right? Like sarcasm. <laughs> but but the, 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 the way that they continue it to where every time they speak across it, it comes off as super sarcastic. <laughs> that was played really well yeah. because I thought, okay, fine. You're going to let that. You're, there's a chasm. It's a sarcasm. Okay, got, fine. But as soon as they start talking back and forth, like that's a great bit actually. You know what I mean? Like uh, that was pretty cool. <laughs> The other, the other thing I really love too is that when they were in the vault, right, mm. with the, with oh the, um, with the, <laughs> with the, with the secrets or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And Bluefy, I think, I think his name was Bluefy, right? The little two D animated guy. Yeah. Bluefy. Yeah. Sounds when right. Bluefy comes out and he's like, because that was like a character from her like her favorite show. Yeah. And he was like talking to the camera like Blue's Clues or something, like, hey kids, you know. Yeah. I thought it was hilarious and so genius. And then he even like kind of spills her secret, like, hey, Riley still likes to watch the show, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And then the new character, Pouchy. Yep. And yep. he get and it's and it's just like those kids' shows, right? It's like there's three items. Which one's the correct item, you know? And so Pouchy will well, well here's a here's a <laughs> Uh, uh, here's some tape, here's an apple, or dynamite, which is the correct idea. You know, it, it was so brilliantly handled. I just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. And the, and the film is, uh, the film has equal parts endearing, but also has equal parts bits. That they, yeah. they said, this is a comedy bit, and we have hired very talented comedy legends in a lot of, in a lot of different ways um to do these it, it, it works out really really well um for me i like the first one better but part of that is um part of that is just the newness of something and saying like i've never seen anything like this before the okay. the sheer audacity to say that we are going to do something so i would compare it just to a certain degree to um to soul which I think soul is good, but soul doesn't reach that level of like, you just explain the human experience, the shared human experience. Now there, there could be some, there could be some criticisms and I would actually love to hear you in the comments if, if you had a slightly different growing up experience, because right. I do think that there could be some, some criticism here of like, this is a very stable family. Uh, they seem like they're pretty well off, to be honest. Like they're living in San Francisco, and and they've they have pretty nice things. You know, the fact that she can play hockey means that they're wealthy. Because yeah. <laughs> let's face it, that's not, not a cheap person sport. <laughs> no, not at all. It's like, do you want to play golf or hockey? Like, okay, thanks, upper middle class. We know where you fit, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, even just San Francisco, that is not a cheap city to live. In. No, not even. They're close. doing fine. <laughs> they're doing it, real well. It, it, yeah. It, she's doing horseback riding. She got her own <laughs> pony, you know. Exactly, and because of that, that, in this film, I think that's a good reason why they don't really emphasize San mm. Francisco as much. They don't really emphasize so that, like, it can be any kid from anywhere. The only thing they emphasize is right. She continues to play hockey, and she has like these friends. Yeah. Um. But other than that, like, it felt like the first film they definitely emphasized San Francisco. Yeah. They emphasize her dad getting a job that's paying better. Yeah. You know, they're eating they're eating at a fancy pizza place that puts broccoli on pizza. Like <laughs> right. You know, they're not like eating little Caesars or something like that. Like, yeah, in the second film, they I think they de-emphasize that a bit more. Yeah, um, they do. Yeah. But where I was going with it was I would be curious to see if you didn't have a, a middle class lived experience, if you would sure. if you would experience your emotions in a slightly different way. Right. So yeah. because. You know, if you, if you live in a place where there's you're facing trauma every single day, you're probably like, I'm not sure this is how I experience yeah. emotions, you know? 
I can't relate to Riley and her middle class problems. You know? Yeah, exactly. I well, definitely get what you're saying. Right? Yeah, that, that's totally true. Because you have, if you have, a, a, say, a kid that grew up like really rough childhood, like real serious stuff, you know, Riley worrying about winning the big game <laughs> is, is right. very trivial right. compared to some kids that really have a rough, rough life. You know, what exactly, I'm saying? exactly. So I, I would be curious to. So as I'm saying this, I think that the first one was so audacious that it took a shared experience that a lot of us have of trying to understand our emotions, trying to think that some emotions are worse than others and because they don't make me feel good. Because that was such an audacious thing to do and to be able to say that you hit a home run is almost like insane, right? Like, because I would argue that soul, like soul also aims for the fences and like sort of gets there, but it's not as ubiquitous of an experience as is um, Inside Out. And so I think that when you, when you see the sequel, it's almost like you're expecting the same kind of mind blowing experience, but it's like, oh, well, I already had the mind blowing experience. This is just yeah. now playing in the same, um, playing in the same field. So I, I, I still like the second one a lot and think that it deserved the 1.6 billion and think that to me, as a person who does think that Pixar has been kind of up and down and not really at the level that it was before, this is a return to form for what my expectations of Pixar are. So when I'm saying that, I'm saying like the first film is probably like, you know, 9.5 plus <laughs> and this film is still hitting a nine. It's just maybe not hitting, you know, 9.5 or something like that. So it's still a fantastic film. Um, uh, I will say, I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 go, no go ahead, Megan. No, go ahead, go ahead. You first. Uh, I was, I was going to say just you were talking about how uh, a profound experience watching the first one was. I got to tell you. As somebody who avoided watching these movies for as long as I possibly could because I was fully anticipating the Pixar emotional gut punch, <laughs> I was actually shocked at how not small of a story it was, but the, the focus of Riley's emotional journey because it being Pixar, I had somehow convinced myself over the course of the last several years, you know, since this first movie came out, that the the first movie was about Riley learning how to deal with grief mm. and specifically sadness in that way from having like lost a family member or something. I tricked myself mm. into thinking that this movie was about her losing a sibling and having to deal with like the emotional turmoil that comes with losing a loved one in that way. So imagine my relief. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the case. I was like, oh, thank God. I'm still crying, but oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is Disney, so they have a history of killing off exactly. family members. <laughs> yeah. They do. Uh, Lion King, I, I, seriously, I think Lion King is a cinematic masterpiece. It really mm. is, but I have a hard time watching it. Mm. I, I, that scene is so rough to get through, man. I just can't. I just can't. And Dumbo. Oh, my God. Dumbo. Don't even get me started on Dumbo. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of them man there's a lot of them that they uh they don't they don't pull any punches um so let's let's jump i'm gonna jump all over the place in this conversation because there's so much we could talk about but i do want to um i do want to go back to megan's question uh which is not so much a question about the story but about future stories that could be told by pixar and this idea that disney has has learned two lessons and the question that Megan asked was, are these good lessons? The two lessons are, we can make a live action anything and make a bunch of money off of it, right? right. I don't know that they've ever had a losing live action. Uh, they've at least broken even on those. I, there may be one or two where they you know, maybe didn't make back all of their money. How, um, how successful was the uh, live action Jungle Book from the 90s? How was that? <laughs> oh, that's right. a good question. I don't even remember that. <laughs> but yeah, good or the, uh, the 101 Dalmatian live action movies. I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the 101 Dalmatians were at least pretty successful. They did really well. Yeah. yeah. I actually yeah. think that Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book from the 90s also did really I well. I love that movie. But it was darker. Yeah. It was darker and grittier and more true to the book. And I think people were like, wow, why they do this? <laughs> this is just here. Yeah. yeah. I think it was directed by Steven Summers, uh, which the guy who did the mummy. So that uh, puts some pieces together. <laughs> yeah. So so in this, like you can do live action remakes or you can do sequels. Those make money, right? Um mm. 
And that's almost that's almost like if you got to look at the hit rate of a live action remake or a sequel, I mean the hit rate is insanely high comparative to, you know, trying to do something new. Um and I I, I, would, I would have to go look at the percentage. What's that? That's not just Disney either. That's like across totally. The board. So yeah, it's for it's for everybody. D- Disney has this thing though that they have such um, Disney has such a history of creating powerful characters, and one of the things we know is that we attach ourselves to characters in many ways. And so, so Disney has this like this like width and breadth of characters that is unbelievable um, in comparison to a lot of other of their competitors. So the question then is, and I'll start with you, OG, on this one. Yeah. Is, do you think that they're learning the right lesson or do you think that they're learning the wrong lesson and and is the lesson about money or is the lesson about influencing culture and drawing in people who love what disney is trying to do and 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 how do you balance those things as a business it's tough it's tough okay so here here's my take on it i was actually really encouraged when we went to the d23 expo a couple months ago right we went to the the studio panel and they showed us footage from like that upcoming pixar film elio right which now this is a movie i had no real interest in before the expo Mm -hmm. they showed us footage and it was very it was it was very it kind of reminded me of inside out too where I, i was saying how there's like themes in there that adults can really pull from you know what i'm saying with like mental health and things like that elio tapped into your imagination now we've done a lot of shows like we recently did a show about the afterlife on this channel and stuff like that i love that stuff and the universe elio taps into like what's out there like mm-hmm. life and other planets and they and they lean in on it at least the stuff that we saw at d23 yeah. um i was really encouraged that i went from having zero interest in that movie to like i really want to see this thing now you know what i'm saying so uh, with pixar i feel like there are original films on the horizon like Elio that I think have potential. I don't know. I mean, for me personally, I was excited. Hmm. We'll see if the general public and the normies get into it. You know what I'm saying? But here's the thing. I think, I think Disney, they mess up a lot, but I think they still understand like the core kind of idea that like, yes, you can, you can milk sequels forever, right? You can do frozen three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, but you're never going to have the next frozen if you don't ever do original film. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I think Disney as a business sort of understands that. Like, look, I think we're going to get a lot of sequels because those are like the auto wins kind of like you, you're not going to you're not going to have a flop when it's frozen. You know what I'm saying? Pretty much. It's it's almost as it's, it's close to a guaranteed hit as you can possibly get. Nothing's for sure, but you're going to have Elsa and Anna in it. You're probably going to do OK, you know, but like I think that they still understand as well. We have to sprinkle in these original films because if we don't, we're never going to have the next Toy Story or the next Frozen or any of these other films. So I think we're going to be OK. But here's the thing. I was a real animation like purist for the longest time when it came to Disney. I didn't want them to do sequels for their animated films at all because they never really did. Mm-hmm. You know, back in like Wall Street, he never did sequels or any of that. Um, yeah, we got like in the early 90s, I think it was 1990, we got Rescuers Down Under, which is a great sequel. But, you know, that was like one. I was like, okay, we can kind of forgive that. You know what I'm saying? But then they really started to ramp up the sequels. I'm like, oh, gosh, like Wreck-It Ralph 2 and all this stuff. And I was like, this isn't what Disney used to do, you know? I'm a little more forgiving now because I do know it is a changing landscape. The world is different now than it was in like 19, you know. 35 or 40 or whatever you know so i kind of get it now i'm kind of rolling with it um as long as they make quality sequels i'm good at this point you know just don't churn out like i think in all honesty i think illumination is real guilty of this where it's just sequels for the sake of sequels we're like 97 minion movies and like that's where i hope that's the route i hope disney doesn't go in if you have a good story to tell you have a you know frozen three and four if this is a cool story i'm cool with that you know you're expanding this 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 world you know that's cool but just have something to say and just make it quality don't do like the whole like Hanna Barbera illumination thing where you're just like churning stuff out for the sake of like churning it out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we'll see, but I am encouraged with what I saw at D23 in regards to the Pixar live actions. I mean, the Pixar um, original films. Um, I think there's a lot of potential there. And um, I think we, I think we are going to see a lot more originality, but it will be sprinkled in with sequels because, you know, sequels are less of a risk for these studios at this point. So yeah. we'll see. 
Pixar live action would be wild, by the way. <laughs> you know, it was funny. They actually asked. There was a, there was some news about that, like a like a couple months ago. I think they asked Pete Doctor about yeah. that. Like, would you be, would you support a? I don't know if you guys remember this, but they asked him like, would you support live action Pixar movies? And he said, no, we're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. Uh, Megan, I'll come to you last since you brought it up. So, Josh, what do you think? You you as mm. the, as the resident animation scholar on this sure. panel. What is what is uh, what makes for good animation when it comes to sequels? And do, does it matter? Do, do they need it? Does it need? Do they need to have those kind of sequels to be successful and make money? How does that work? Um, I, I mean, I agree with with OG there in the sense business is difficult. We're in an age where, especially economically, you know, people are less willing to make a gamble on something that they're unfamiliar with. It's easier to say, hey. We know these characters. We know a little bit about this world. Let's spend the money to go and see this. Uh, or, you know, let's buy into Disney Plus finally to make sure that we watch this, whatever the case is. Um, and, you know, like the thing about Disney in particular, uh, Universal also to a certain degree, is they have to think about a larger global thing with the theme parks and all this other stuff. So, like, they have a hit on their hands. Do they want to continue to try and, you know, have more hits within the same world so that they can build that world mm -hmm. in a real, in a real space. Um, so they have that to think about There's a lot of business in involved in that. I think for film folks, uh, for people like any of us here, probably people watching, they go like, I want more original films. And like, yes, I agree. I would love more originality. Um, and, and we are getting that to a certain extent outside of Disney or other places, but you have to like pull yourself out of the bubble for a second and say, if these studios are going to survive and, you know, right now, a lot of them are struggling post COVID post um, strikes. We're in a changing landscape in Hollywood um, and in, in the movie industry and in the American movie industry. And because of that, I think they have to make a couple of safe bets in order to stay afloat mm. and that probably means more sequels than original pieces um a little less experimenting mm. we are seeing some stuff and i think that this year in particular is actually a really great year for animation uh outside of inside out 2 my favorite film it came out uh on the like <clears throat> film circuit uh you know making its rounds last year but this year i think it got its american release which is robot dreams which I think is like one of the greatest animated films of the last five years or so. Um, Wild Robot has a ton of buzz going around on it right now. Uh, you know, we've got, I mean, in the past few years, we've gotten one and two and going to get a third Spider-Verse film. They all look fantastic. Uh, we're in a great space in animation right now. So if you're saying that oh, Disney isn't giving me what I want, look outside the Disney bubble because there's a ton of animation. Right. And, Everywhere. But as far as a big conglomerate like Disney, having stockholders, having to kind of have a giant income always coming in because they're putting a ton of money out in some projects that aren't making a ton of money, a.k.a. Marvel right now, um, you know, uh, to have a blow away hit like Inside Out 2 is a, is significant for that company. So uh, you kind of have to look at it from that business standpoint. Yeah, and Josh, make a, you you make a great point because like as super fans, like you know, we we all kind of get into this. It's really easy to get into like the nerd bubble, you know, right? And yeah. like what what we want as nerds, we deal with it a lot. I know you're a big theme park guy too. In in the theme park space, it's like, well, I don't want I don't want Cars Land in the Magic Kingdom. I want I want Mark Davis's Western River Expedition concept. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I get you that. Yeah, I get that. But but like, you know, the normie, the soccer mom wants the car ride, you know what I'm saying? And and that's the, yeah. the vast majority of, of who Disney's playing to. And so as nerds, yeah, we want the Mark Davis thing. But like, you know, there there has to be a little bit of self-awareness there with the fandom. Like Disney, like you said, Josh, and you're 100% right on this. They're a business. They have to play to as many people as possible. So, you know, they got to they gotta consider all that. So, yeah. Well, even looking at universal right like they're launching a brand new theme park next year they're continuing to have now in a third theme park a harry potter mm. space mm. and 
it's been God, over over a decade since the last like official Harry Potter film, you know, and then we had the continued Wizarding World that was supposed to be like five or six movies that died off. And then they've now announced that they have a brand new series coming because they need it. You know, they need to continue that world in order to keep business going, mm. um, which is an unfortunate reality in the fact that where we're at, I guess, and this is a, a whole different conversation, but in the theme park world, I've always been of the belief that you should have the general adventure land with an attraction theme to a, a movie versus a whole land theme to a movie because then you have the larger risk of if that movie falls out of relevance, you have to demo the whole land, not just one ride. Mm. Um, and so you've got to think now with a car, a new Cars Land coming, there's probably going to be at least something new in Cars at Pixar in the future soon. Um, same with Universal and Harry Potter and all those other things. So uh, there's very few things that feel permanent in the world of, of film. Mm. And because of that, these big conglomerations have to keep all the plates spinning. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it, I think um, what I really love about what Josh said is that he seems to have the uh, William Shatner filter on his computer. And it, it pauses every once in a while just for a half second and makes everything you're saying oh, no. more like I'm hanging on it. No, no, no. It's actually, it's actually not bad enough that, you, that, it's like, that it's like you can't understand. But it, it does sound like, like a William Shatner cadence. It's kind of perfect. <laughs> I kind of love Thank it. You. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it was planned. Um, Megan, you asked the question. What do you think? Too, too many sequels? Uh, I think that Disney, Pixar, and every other film conglomerate out there will make movies that they will continue to make movies that they think are going to make them money. And what that means is uh, that they will continue to chase whatever will I mean, to an extent, they will be setting the trends too, but they will they will be chasing whatever the film trend of the time is, and that has changed like time and time again. Uh, movie, it's a tale as old as time. A movie studio will create something, and it will be popular, and it will create a franchise around that. Um, or it will uh, jump into that genre wholeheartedly uh, until audiences are no longer really interested in seeing those. So they will chase the trend for as long as it's popular and as long as it makes them money. And then when it doesn't anymore, that is when we will see the, the trends shift and change is when audiences have an appetite for something new. Um, and so... You, I, I concur wholeheartedly. There are things to consider, like the um, life of an IP, the uh, and the health of a franchise, uh, and how that taps into the long range planning of theme parks, and you know why the the cross promotion of television shows and other media's like comic books and uh, video games and things like that. Um, all of that is relevant and important. Um, but, you know, if you look at the history of film, you you see things like the universal horror, you know, monster movies and mm -hmm. like those came and they were around for a while and then they left uh, a big boom in film noir, you know, when people came back from World War Two. And that was a trend for a while. And then that fell out of fashion and Westerns were really big for a long time. And then those fell out of fashion. Uh, slasher movies in the 80s were really profitable because you could make them for next to nothing. <laughs> and those were uh, something that, um, you know, persisted throughout the decade um, and still get a lot of love to this day. Uh, I, I am very fond of my 80s slasher movies. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so and, and obviously those things still persist. You know, you do get blending of genres. You do get modern Westerns. You do get modern film noirs. But they don't exist in the same way that they did when the trend was popularized. So yeah. I think all of the things that we're seeing right now, uh, if you not taking into account, you know, the, the existence of streaming and how that has impacted things. Um, 
But like, if you just kind of look at it as like, oh yeah, these are the film trends that are happening right now. I wonder what the film trend will be 10 years from now. Well, it, 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 you, you bring up a great, oh, I'm sorry. You, you bring up a great point, Megan, too, with film trends, because, uh, you know, I don't know, even just like seven or eight years ago, everyone wanted a cinematic universe. Like every, every studio wanted to duplicate that cinematic universe that Marvel was so, was so successful in. But now I feel like the cinematic universe, the connective universes are kind of falling out of favor. I feel yeah. like these studios now want to do more standalones and stuff like that because there, there are cons to the cinematic universe because it's great when your movies are doing, every movie's doing banger numbers, but cinematic universes aren't so great when you don't have that success rate because now if a movie flops, it impacts the future films because it's all connected. So there is a huge downside to it, but... I mean, to your point, there's all these trends. And even just from six, seven years ago, that has fallen out of favor. You know, go, go ahead, Josh. I do apologize, brother. Yeah, no, no. You're on the same path that I am. Uh, I think it's been since the year 2000. Um, if you were to look at like the box office numbers for every year going back, it's like every year since the year 2000, the top 10 films have pretty much been dominated by at least seven to, you know, eight films maybe even the whole 10 have all been films that are either franchise films sequels remakes etc it has been a trend and it really has to stem from again going back to economics um you know where the world was at at the time uh, i mean when the when the bush administration came in and we went to war in iraq i think a lot of people were looking for escapism and at that point you know we were talking about world building with harry potter and the lord of the rings and returning to star wars at that time um and then you know we move into this time period where uh we're still talking about even you know post iraq you know we get into marvel and things like that and talk about like the military industrial complex or whatever we're still in this space that we've been in since 2000 of escapism and i think it also follows what we see every day not just in the news but it's really difficult to escape when we're all so online. Um, watching a movie gives us two hours of a different place and we can put our phones down. Well, hopefully most of us can put our phones down to watch a movie. Uh, you know, I know that's Especially difficult. Especially if you're for in the theater, you must. Yeah, <laughs> yes. seriously. But, yeah. but, you know, the, I do wonder and I think about where we're going because it does seem like there's been an uptick of uh, independent films in the past few years it feels like neon a24 are starting to become a little bit more popular uh as as far as distributors and production houses it feels like in the animation space more people are looking at things outside of illumination and dreamworks and and pixar and disney and i hope that as that trend continues to rise we see some of the bigger companies as well see that that's popular enough and they can make money on a cheaper budget. Um, especially, like Megan probably knows this, you know, horror has had a huge trend upward in the past few years because it's cheap to make and it makes a lot of money. And people are really into it right now. Mm -hmm. Because of that, there's more and more horror films every year. It used to be like, oh, yeah, it's Halloween time. There's going to be 10. And now it's like all year long. There's just horror films. Um I think animation is going in that direction and I'm interested to see if maybe the Disney and Pixar pivot away from their plan. I know they have like a long five, 10 year plan. If you're to look at their Wikipedia, it's like untitled project for the next 10 years, but I think that they could pivot away from it as well. It depends on the politics and economics and where we're at societally. Yeah. It, the economics is a big thing too, because like, like, um, you know, with streaming and stuff, right? Like to take, okay, for an animated movie, typically you're going to have like a family of four or five. You're going to have a probably a few kids, right? So you're taking like, you know, several people to the theater. That's, ex that's an, that can be a very expensive endeavor. You know what I'm saying? That can run you a hundred dollars or more just to, just to walk in there. That's not even including all the, all the candy and snacks and all that stuff, right? So it's hard to like sell that to a family to spend that much money on an animated movie when that thing will be on your kid's iPad in a couple of months, you know what I'm saying? You yeah. can watch it at home and they can, and they can have it on repeat and just watch it all day long. So that's why it's so hard for these studios now to like, I think to get butts and seats for animation because it's not like a, a like a, um, 
like a like say like a romantic film where you know a lot of couples go it's you and your girlfriend or something right or you and your husband right you know when you have a family movie like an inside out two or you know whatever you, like the whole family goes that's mm -hmm. pricey so the like fa like people have to be really like wanting to see this stuff if, when it's animation it's especially like important because it's like am i going to spend 150 bucks to take my family or am i going to wait a couple weeks and or a, a couple months and see it on my ipad and i think that's why a lot of these animated films like you know like wish and the films that don't do as well, I think that's a big equation to it. Not that they're bad movies, because they actually end up performing pretty well on the streamers. It's just not intriguing enough for people to like, okay, I'm going to spend hundred plus dollars to go see it in the theater. Families are getting much pickier with it. So, yeah. yeah. When when I was a kid, and I'm sure when we were all kids, yeah, going to the movies was the cheap option if you wanted yeah. to do something with your friends or with your family. It doesn't really feel that way anymore. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh. No, I think what we're at, I think what we're at, and not to take up too much of your time because Shay, I know you want to move on pretty quickly, but because of streaming, and I think we're in a weird moment here where I think they'll figure it out. I do think that we will probably move more into advertising on streaming in general. Um, you know, the the days of spending ten bucks to to not see advertisements is probably going to be dead and gone sometime in the next few years. But because of that, I think it's going to go the same way that music has gone, which is okay, people are, you know, getting on Spotify, they're not buying albums. So the way that most musicians are making all of their money is by touring and merchandising. So you look at a film like Inside Out 2, it makes a lot of sense to make. It makes a lot of sense to introduce a plethora of new characters yeah. because you could sell a plush doll, not just of anxiety, but also of envy, of embarrassment, of anyway, of you know, uh, whether well, there's like nine emotions, cool, get all nine plushies, like <laughs> you know, collect the whole set. Like that's where they're making their money. That's why we're continuing to get sequels and world building being a huge part of it because look, we can build this world at a theme park and you can experience it for $170 a person. Doesn't that sound like thrilling? Um, I, that's kind of their quick fix, I think, right now. And I, I think that as Hollywood adjusts and figures out where they can make money in streaming or getting people back into cinemas in some way, that's kind of the route they have to go economically. You know, Josh, you had me at anxiety, pl anxiety plushy. You should get one. <laughs> <laughs> get one. The, the only thing I'll add, because I think you guys have said um, a lot of the things that I would have agreed with. The one thing that, that I don't think a lot of people think about um, is how the... I'll call it the user experience or the customer experience has also shifted. I was just listening to a Matt Bellany show, he, the town um, podcast where he was interviewing. Did you hear this right. one, OG? Did no, you, but I, I'm a huge fan of his. I usually, great. I listen to him all eventually. Yeah, you know, he's but amazing. He's fantastic. And he was talking to the, to the, um, one of the producers, one of the guys at the studio that put out Terrifier 3. Um, and Terrifier 3 just made a bunch of money. Um, yeah, Megan, Megan, I'm sure you've already seen it, Megan. You were probably the first in line to see it on opening night. Um, I actually haven't seen any of the terrifying oh. movies, but I'm so happy that it's doing well. It's doing really well. And one <laughs> of the things he was talking about, um, it's, it's, the, it's his most successful movie that he's ever been part of is what he said. And uh, one of the things that he was talking about was what it took for that film to be profitable. Now, let's just let's just take one step back and say that film is not likely to make a hundred million dollars at the box office, right? Like it made, I think, thirteen million. Yeah, yeah it's probably not going to happen. So, why are we calling this film successful? Well, this film was made for like two million dollars, two million dollar production budget, and and they did not. So, so why am I bringing up this topic? Our experience is very different than our experience would have been in theaters 20 years ago, 30 years ago. When I was a kid, um, there were no uh, targeted websites. There were no websites when I was a kid. There were no targeted websites where I would go, uh, what am I supposed to go see this weekend? It was only, hey, we're going to go out and we're going to see what the big movies are. And we're going to go to the theater and see what's on. Sometimes when I was a kid, we used to go to the theater not knowing what we were going to see. I mean, that's, that's insane to think yeah. about today. You, right. you don't ever go to the theater going like, what should I see? You always think like, I got to go. I, I want to get good seats. So I got to pick this particular film. I'm, I'm kind of more um, choosy with my budget. And so there's this, there's this, there's this, um, there's this way uh, that we think 
something needs think about it from Pixar's perspective. Pixar says if we're going to make 1.6 billion, that means our in, the, in, the the marketplace for our film is global. There are no niches that we're going after. It is a four quadrant film. We need to attract everyone to this film. And by the way, we have to because it costs 200 million dollars to make. I don't know the budget for uh, Inside Out 2 specifically, but it's certainly over 100 million. So what we don't understand is that we all kind of live in a little bit of an information bubble because we are able to choose whatever we want to listen to and whatever we don't want to listen to. And that was not the lived experience of somebody in the 80s. The 80s, you just get whatever's on the air is what I listen to, right? right. Um, we were talking about it the other day. My wife and I were talking about it the other day. They used to turn they used to turn channels off at night. You couldn't watch TV at night. It went it when it, it, yeah. the bars came up, you know what I'm saying? Like, so these days we go, not only can it be 2 a.m. in the morning, you can say, I want to watch a film about vampires, but I want it to be a romantic comedy. And you can find it. You can go find that at 2 a.m. if you want to. Yeah. So this, this idea that, um, this idea that films can only be successful if they're large market films because that was what was true in the 80s is just not true anymore the difficulty is how do you how do you curate that marketplace so that your name pops up your film pops up when people are searching for those kinds of things it's a very very different equation one of the reasons terrifier 3 is making a bunch of money is because uh I think it's bloody disgusting. That's what I want to say. Is that the studio yeah. that made Terrifier Three also owns Bloody Disgusting? Okay, yes. so they have a direct channel into their most targeted audience, wow. and so that audience is going to say, "Wow, this is really cool." Now, now it has to be a good film to make money. It has to be a good film, but um, but that's part of the equation. So. The way that he started to describe his business model, anybody who's interested in filmmaking should go listen to the Matt Bellany, The Town. I believe it was from, uh, what's, what day is today? Today is Thursday. I think it was Monday's show or, or Wednesday's show. <laughs> yeah, the 17th of October. Go back a couple days and, uh, and that's when it was. The business model that they had to have to make profit out of that film is absolutely insane. And, and, and by the way, bears no resemblance to Pixar and their business model, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so it's, it's a very different marketplace that we're dealing with. And it's a, it's good news for like what Josh said for independent filmmakers like me. Um, but it is it is scary because it, the, the, the risk you're putting in and what you're doing is, is difficult to know if you're going to get a return. So if you're sitting at the head of Pixar, if you're sitting at the head of Disney, you go, man, I can print money tomorrow if I make a sequel. Oh, yeah. And, and, and kind of to circle back to Inside Out, too, you know, I feel like this this particular subject matter, right? The emotions inside, you, you know, your head or whatever. It, you can you can literally from a business perspective. Right. And hopefully they do it right creatively, obviously. But um, you could tap into that forever. I mean, <laughs> you can you can follow this girl until she's 90 years old. Yeah. You could even do, you can even do, if you really want to get like totally shameless, I mean, you can even do like, like a, like a Toy Story crossover and you can be in Andy's head. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, there's potential there forever. You can pick, you can have a new kid for, you know, not Riley, but maybe a, a young, a young boy one time or whatever. You can make nine, you can make a, a dozen sequels on, on that concept and all the emotions and feelings and all that stuff. You can make a cute character for each and every one of them. And every time they make a new one, you, you sell the plushie at the Disney parks. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a gold mine. It really is, you know, but you know, I can they see the temptation there. That a little bit in both movies when we get those brief glimpses into other people's heads. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's so, so, you know, just as a complete side note, it's so interesting um, in the first movie when you see into Riley's parents' heads, which emotion is, is the essentially the leader of the console for her mother, it's sadness. And for her father, it's anger. And yeah. it's just like, that's very, very like, for, for Riley, it's Joy who's in charge. And for those two, it's uh, those respective emotions. And I think that's just a very, very bit mm. of interesting character, um, you know, character writing um, without ever having to convey a single thing through dialogue. Like mm. it tells you exactly which one of, <laughs> which emotion is in charge of both of those people. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. We could hop into somebody else's head and deal with any number of stories and issues that touch on emotion, which is 
literally limitless. Um, yeah. And we were we were talking earlier about whether or not uh, Riley's experience as an upper middle class white girl is a ubiquitous one, quote unquote, or if, um, you know, people from different backgrounds would interact with their emotions differently and their memories differently. Um, and Pixar certainly has the the ability to uh, tell those different stories if they felt so inclined, mm. you know, if they felt like that was uh, an avenue, a sequel where they could engage with those things. And, and would, to add to that, I would be interested in that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it, it's it, fascinating. Yeah, and, and and to pick up on it, one of the things that is is really critical to think about when you think about animation specifically, and I encourage anybody that wants to learn how in depth Pixar goes with their animations to watch the documentary that follows the making of Frozen 2. Because you see like this this person is spending six months of their life animating a 10 second sequence, right? Like right. it's insane. Now, but but one of the important things about animation and, and my wife and I have been watching uh, Monsters at Work, which I think is a phenomenal show. It's it's so funny. Um, and and then everybody everybody is a comedian on the on the um, on the voice actor squad, and they're all just very very funny. And but, I, and I love how in that world um, they don't have like monster names. It's like Frank yeah. and Bob. And <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I know, but all the other th all the other puns still exist too, right? Like all the mon the monster puns. But one of the things that makes um 3d animation i think easier to go back to the well on and why i like the fact that disney plus can do shows this way is that once you have the models once you've designed the mod the character models yes. you can reuse those character models and guess what they don't get old they don't go on social media and say stupid shit that gets them canceled. <laughs> like, like you know what I mean? Like, you, you, you get a chance. You can swap out the voices, which they did for Inside Out 2, by the way, because they took um, Tony Hale, replaced um, Bill, Hader. Uh, Bill Hader. Thank you. And uh, Mindy Kaling was replaced by uh, somebody else that I can't remember who it was. So I apologize to that person. But um, they did a phenomenal job. So you, so you can actually swap out the uh, voice actors a little bit easier and keep the thing going you it's real difficult when chris evans comes back and he's 65 years old and you're like i don't know man he's not really captain america anymore you know what i mean like so i think that there's um there's a lot of temptation there so it's good and it enables more stories to be told but there is there could be a going back to the well too many times and trying to fast and furious <laughs> let's face it like that that franchise has pretty much run its course right so um anyway i digress let's get back to the let's get back to the story a little bit that was a great detour i loved it um what did you guys think about what was your response when it gets into the beliefs and it starts to talk about what riley believes about herself and how that arc changes over time she starts i wrote i wrote down some of the phrases i'm a really good friend i'm a good person i'm a winner and then that sort of changes over the course of time. Not only the way that she thinks about herself, but also her behavior and how she interacts with the world changes over time as well to sort of shape those views. I'll start with you, OG, um, as maybe the person who liked the film better than anybody. I love um, it, yeah. Yeah. What was, what was your thought process about the changing belief system of Riley and how, how did it impact you and how do you think that they handled it? I think they handled it really well. It's kind of it's kind of interesting. It, it kind of like it's kind of almost like a uh, chicken and the egg kind of thing, right? Like, do the does the behavior d does her behavior dictate how she feels about herself, mm. or does her her feeling about herself dictate how she starts to behave? Like, if you think you're a bad person, and you think you know you're 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 bad, you're going to behave a certain way compared to like, if you have this belief system that, Hey, I'm a good person, right. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to go through life differently. So I thought that was kind of fascinating, you know, and it's interesting too, how I think they hit the nail on the head too, when they were saying stuff like how the memories kind of shape the person, mm -hmm. right. It's so true. Like you, that's why people ask me, like, you know, when you talk about like your past relationships and things like that, right. People are like, oh man, you're with her for so many years. And like, don't you regret it? No, I don't. I don't regret it at all. It didn't work out, but that experience, those memories shaped me and helped me grow as a person. So while the relationship might've ended, 
the growth that came from that is invaluable. You know what I'm saying? So I like that kind of messaging in this film where like her memory shape her as a person and who she is and how she grows. I thought it was, I thought that was absolutely brilliant. I love they added that belief system in there. That was a great element to this, uh, to this um, sequel. I, I loved it. Absolutely. And it also makes a lot of sense. I mean, you do have beliefs as a younger child, like, like Riley in the first film you do, right. but, but they're not as, um, what fancy word do you want to use? They're not as ingrained in you, right? They're, 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 they are, you're taking them on from your friends. They're ta you're taking them on from your, your family members. You haven't decided on your own, right? But when you get up to be Riley's age, in 13, I think they said she was, that's when you start to go like, wait a minute, do I actually, <laughs> do I think the way my, do I think the way that my parents think? <laughs> or do I think differently, right? You start to yeah. be impacted in a different way. So that, that's a really good point. What do you think, Megan? Do you think, what do you think about her changing uh, belief system and how that worked? Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I love the way that uh, memories were focused and, you know, the way that core memories uh, in the first one uh, ended up being essentially the foundation for core beliefs. And I loved seeing how that, how that changed over time. And, and I, I fully agree with the, the sentiment that your memories are what make you who you are. Um, you know, are, and, and the way the emotions that we attach to those memories. Right. Um, like if you remember, you know, when you're not pushing something to the back of your head, when you remember something, bad that you did and how it made you feel or how it made the people around you feel like that adjusts your behavior moving forward uh and i'm i'm currently in the process of consuming a couple different stories um uh, that like deal with memory issues uh and like the horror that comes with that like you could have this you know overarching character growth moment uh and then completely forget that you had that moment of growth or that moment of resolve and just go right back to being you oh we lost megan no we, we lost, lost meg we lost Com Meg. we're completely dark right uh, right in the middle of a powerful statement John, yes. Josh, i'll go to, i'll go to you next what, what did you think about this what did you think about this um about the uh, police system and how it works to a certain extent i agree with you to a certain extent i, I actually want to emphasize that. oh i'll let megan finish her statement <laughs> Megan, you're back. Hey, okay. am I still here? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're here. still there. Wait, oh, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> pause. Pause again. <laughs> we'll let. We'll, we'll. I'll come back to you, Megan. You hang in there. I'm gonna go to Josh first, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, so, Josh, what do you think? What do you think about this? You, you kind of agree, yeah. but then yeah, you're gonna throw us a. You're gonna throw us a curveball here. I think that memory plays an important role. I also think that your current life plays an important role mm. when we see riley right she surrounds herself with these new people that she wants to be friends with she starts to take on some of the things that they're doing um and i think that that becomes something of who you are there's a study that and i find this really interesting because i found myself wrapped up in it as well that um when netflix came around and started producing some of their own stuff there was this you know rise in um true crime documentaries and then with podcasting there was this rise in true crime it became like a, a I, I would say like a five-year bubble that eventually burst i think that some people are still listening to it but it's not as popular as it once was mm -hmm. um but what happened around that same time is that there was actually actually an uptick in people that had anxiety there were people that were more fearful They're, they were searching for the killer in front of them you know all the time um because of the things that they were constantly consuming the the people that they were talking to the conversations that they were having all the time mm. um i would say the same thing with horror i'm i'm in the horror community as well as in animation and disney and stuff and i see that with people in horror all the time if that's the only thing you watch it's the only kind of stuff you talk about your outlook on life is a bit more grim mm. than people who only talk about positive things mm. um in that regard it really does change your belief systems and i i think that that is the brilliant part of this film mm. is that you see how all of those things interconnect in order for your beliefs to exist yes. and change and grow and it's really easy for 
something to come along in your life and completely obliterate your entire belief system. Uh, that's really frightening. It goes back to the first film. It losing a bit of your personality is such a frightening thing. Both of these films are about change in different ways. And I think they make a really powerful statement in that it's okay to change, but don't forget about who you are um, and the things that really make you who you are, because you don't want to lose that. And I think that it's the ultimate statement of both of these films, which I think is really, really great. Um, you know, not allowing your emotions to obliterate who you are. You know that you, you bring up. I love. I love how you brought that up, Josh. Like that. That one scene where she was hanging with the uh, with the girls. I, I I forget the name of the hockey team that she wanted to get on. It was the Firehawks. Yeah. Was it Firehawks? I think something I like think that, so. right? Yeah. And she's she they're at, she, they're at the house and they're chilling on the couch, right? And she's like, you know, she's like, yeah, I like get up and glow, right? There's some little pop group or whatever. Yeah. And then, but then she kind of was realizing these girls don't think that's really cool. So then she starts to like act all like, oh, sarcastic. Like, yeah, I really like them, you know? And she's, she's trying to like deny she likes this group so she can like fit in, right? And so that plays into what Josh was saying where it's like, you gotta be careful because you're, you're, you're kind of changing who you are. You can lose your personality real quick, you know? And so many people do that. Mm. it especially happens with like men like men and women like like female interactions and stuff like a, a dude is interested in a female right and he thinks like oh man if i agree with everything she says then she'll like me and it's like it's always the opposite you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> it's always the opposite most of the time they like a little pushback they like you to have like an actual personality of your own right you know you don't they don't want just a mirror copy of every opinion they have like it's boring even in just regular friendships you know mm. but um i like how they tapped into that a little bit in this movie i thought that was very very clever and so important especially for young people like riley's age who are watching that it's okay to be different you should you should embrace your individuality and your originality you shouldn't try to be like everyone else you know i, I, I love that that's the thing i love about this movie so much is that the messaging in it there's so many great messages for kids and, it's and universal. we've all we've all had that moment where we were 13 and someone questioned our taste in something. And we go, yeah, I, I hate that too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. hundred percent. hundred percent. Megan, Megan, uh, why don't you, you, you were on a really great track. What was the, what was the end of that track? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I ended up having to, I got kicked out for a little bit. Um, so I apologize if any, of you no, no problem. Were, no problem. Um, already touched upon, but uh, I definitely felt, called out uh mm. incredibly when we go into the the vault the mind vault that she's in she's got those deep dark secrets of she secretly still likes the show here's her video game crush like so called out uh because definitely there were so many things when i was a kid i was embarrassed to admit that i loved anime um because that was what the weird kids in our class liked mm. and so it it like those bits is just like yeah i get it and and definitely the bit with the boy band um i got a lot of flack when i was younger for for liking boys since growing up <laughs> which is one of the reasons why i love turning red so much um and uh why i really really hope pixar will continue to make original movies uh, because you never know uh who who you're going to touch when you when you tell stories like that but anyway to get back to what i was saying earlier uh, I'm engaging with a lot of different stories right now that um, touch base on memory. Uh, Alan Wake 2 is a video game I'm playing right now um, where uh, like the idea of memory definitely plays into a role like a character is stuck in a place and he resolves. He's like, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. And then he forgets and immediately goes right back into it and just the idea that you can forget something super important like that you can forget this like character defining moment of like i'm not gonna play into your game or i'm gonna make the right choice and be a good person from now on like the idea that you could have that moment of growth and introspection and forget it and it would be gone and mm. you just reset to wherever you were before that happened it's such a terrifying thought um, since we have somewhat of a real world equivalent in the form of dementia, like that is a yes. real, real thing. Um, and that is the true horror of that disease is watching somebody, uh, or if you are unfortunately experiencing it, 
losing your sense of self because your memories are deteriorating. Um, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, if you look at, so if you look I, at like a character like Batman, I mean, his whole arc is based on the memory of his parents getting killed. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That he becomes Batman off of that memory. Mm-hmm. If he, if he, if he lost that memory, he changes who he is completely. Mm. You know? Exactly. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Um, so yeah, I really liked that this this movie found a visual way of conveying that information. Um, but you guys were also talking about how um, it's you know it's important to accept who you are and that it's important to be yourself because if you put on this this mask of who you think other people want you to be because of your anxiety, um, ultimately that you will not become a person that you recognize or are even happy with. Hmm. Um, and that's something we we all have to learn at some point in life. And you know, some people learn it later than others, and some people, even though they know better, will will go back on it depending on the social situation that they're in. Um, something I really liked about this finale and about the overall moral was learning to accept who you are, flaws and all. Mm. Like um, Riley's, like when they when they get back to the control center and they try to reinstate the person that Riley was, it no longer fits Mm -hmm. because of all of the, the memories that had been pushed to the back of her mind. Now coming to the forefront, the person she thought she was no longer fits with the reality of those bad memories, quote unquote, bad memories. Right. Um, And she can only become who she's supposed to be when she accepts all of those things that mm. highlight her flaws as well as her triumphs. Um, and I, I really like that being a part of the, the, the moral of the story is learning to, no, that doesn't give you carte blanche to be a bad person, right. but learning to accept your flaws um, and be at peace with them uh, as a part of who you are, I think is something really powerful and something that I think every person when you are growing up has to learn at some point. Mm. And, and I love how they address at the very end, the anxiety issue. Cause like you were saying earlier on in the show, Megan, how anxiety is important. Like that fight or flight mechanism is there to, to protect us, you know, but sometimes it can get a little out of control in our, in our heads. And it's, and then it becomes detrimental. I like at the end, they sort of like, they handle that in a cute way where it's like when, he, when anxiety, when she was starting to get a little crazy again, Oh my God, this is going to happen. You know, walk over to the chair and she sits down and she's having her anxiety, right? She's sipping her anxiety. <laughs> so super cute and clever. And it was like a, kind of a little, a little wink and a nod to show like, Hey, Riley's managing her, her anxiety. You know, it's, it's, she, it's under control. It's there and it should be every human needs that, but um, it's not out of control anymore mm. you know mm. i i did i think my favorite visual of the the entire movie was the little animation studio where anxiety was dictating you guys need to animate all of these different scenarios <laughs> that <could> possibly <laughs> happen uh that was i think my favorite visual because we all we all do that our anxiety all like we all visualize the terrible things that could happen. Um, and I, I thought that was a really fun way of portraying that. Oh, I, I yeah, love that. that it's cool. crazy too. When you really look back on like, like the, it, it's like catastrophizing, right? Like, Oh, oh gosh, this is going to happen. And this is going to happen. It's the whole worst case scenario thing. But then you look back on your life and all the times you did that 99% of the time, none of those outcomes ever happen. <laughs> yeah. And nothing, and I mean, maybe something, maybe something bad does happen. We're like, okay, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it never is as bad as your mind sort of makes it out to be. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of funny how the brain works like that. It really goes to like the ultimate worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah. It's really good at it too. It's really, uh, it's a fine tuned machine for coming up with horrific things that could happen to you. Um, two, two things I, I want to, I want to come back around because there's one element of, the belief system, I think you guys have nailed it, by the way, and I love the film for all of those things. I'm going to bring up one negative thing, but I'm only doing it because we haven't talked about it. I'm not doing it because it's a giant issue with the film and, you know, <laughs> you, oh, gee, you can just put the laser eyes on on me in the <laughs> and say, say I hated it. Um, the, the red laser eyes? Yeah, the red laser eyes in the thumbnail. Um, but uh, 
one thing I, I wanted to mention that was about that scene specifically. Um, a friend of mine. It was woke, uh, is what you're saying. Yeah, it was, it's so woke. It's so woke. I couldn't even deal with it, OG. Um, I had to turn it off. Um, I was crying so hard I had to turn it off. It was just woke. Um, <laughs> uh, a friend of mine had, did a podcast, um, and he is a part of um, he's a part of a seminary. So he's he's a pastor, and he did a he did a, a this really really creepy. You would probably like this, Megan. Um, this really really <laughs> creepy podcast about horror films and why horror films are important to us. And he was so into it that he started talking to actual exorcist priests. And wow. like, and they play, and they play the, they play the audio from some of the exorcisms and stuff. I'm like, dude, what are you trying to do? You're trying to give me the worst complex I've ever had. Um, <laughs> but one of the people that he interviews is Pete Doctor, oh. and he talks about how effective sometimes horror is in Pixar. And one of the things that I thought was really like a like shot from a horror perspective is in that scene where they've got the whole animation studio doing their things, and she goes, and she realizes joy. Are you in there, Joy? And it's like, oh my gosh, that's so terrifying. That she knows exactly where she is and she's going to come after her. And so there's this element of Pixar that they can even, because they're playing with these very emotional things, they can actually work their way into horror and it does not feel awkward for the way for where they're going. It's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, the one I would thing. Pay oh. so much money for a, an animated movie where we get into somebody's head where fear is the is the one Oof. at the control center i would pay so much money for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah the megan salinas film that you should pitch that to pixar really it would be pretty pretty amazing um good <laughs> so the, here's the one thing here's the one thing i'll say um there is a and i'm going to call this a i i am an elder millennial i'm on the very border i i didn't i don't make it into gen x i make it into being a millennial so i say this as a millennial critiquing my gen, my own generation um, I think that there's a sensibility in this film. I, I, I really like the way that, that you guys described her changing emotion and the realization that I, I, I am a person who has good and bad about me and therefore I have to deal with it. Um, there is a little bit of an undercurrent and, and, and I might be being a little bit too picky about this, but it also happened to me with the Barbie film, which I think is a very good film. And I think that uh, Greta Gerwig is amazing. And what she did with that film is remarkable um, because it's a Barbie film that's actually like has meaning and purpose. But there's one thing that's true about both of the films that I think I struggle with a little bit. And I think it is pervasive in the millennial generation. And that is sometimes I think that the millennial generation of which I am a part of can be so concerned about the way that they feel that they make it their personality is how they feel. And I don't think that our personality is only dictated by how we feel. And I also think that there's something that is um, that, that can be damaging. And this is more apparent in the Barbie film, but I think it's present here a little bit. There's a little bit of a through line of we have to tell ourselves that everything is okay. Now, I get it. Power of positive thinking. You should not be negative thinking. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm not saying that that's bad, but I am saying that there. I think that that can be taken to toxic levels, and I think I've even seen it in some of my friends where it's like, I'm going to keep telling myself I'm okay, but you're really not okay. Like you, we need to figure out. We yeah. need to work through this in a way that we're working through a real problem because it is a problem. And if we just tell ourselves it's okay, I think we actually could could do ourselves a vast disservice. And the people around us a vast disservice. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point, Jay. And the thing too is, people think it's like okay, for, for example, like that, like when something is not right, like okay, I, you know, you're not okay, and you're telling yourself, "I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay." People think like I'm being positive, and that's a good thing. No, no, it's not a good thing. Being positive and being like, there's a way to be kind of clueless positive, which is that, which is like, there's no problem, everything's fine, everything's fine, and which then there's a way to be like an inside out one. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then there's a way to be constructive positive where it's like, okay, I know there's a problem, mm -hmm. but I'm going to, I'm going to sort this out and we're going to get to a, a solution. Mm -hmm. Right. So acknowledge the problem and it's going to be hard work, but at the end of the day, I'll be fine. That's a lot more constructive than just yes. like convincing yourself that things are fine when they're not. And it's yeah. not healthy. And you're right, Jay, it's totally toxic. Yeah. And I think, I think it's a very minor undercurrent. I don't think that they're pushing it, but it just, it just stood out to me because 
What we said was that Riley's doing great at the beginning of the film because she told herself, I am a really good friend, I'm a really I'm a good person, and I'm a winner. And, and I'm going like, yeah, but you have value and worth even if you don't believe those things about yourself. And and, and I think that's true by the end of the film, but but there's a little bit of a suggestion in there that like that it's important to think of ourselves as a good person. And I'm like, yeah, but some people really struggle with that. And 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 if you are struggling with that, the solution is not to isolate. The solution is to to be around other people who can see the good in you and see the bad in you, um, and and help you deal with all of it. So I think that happens in the film, but there's a little bit of an undercurrent of that millennial thinking that whenever I see it, I'm like, I feel like that's not quite. Imagine, imagine being Barbie and keeping telling yourself that everything's okay when everything's really not okay. That's not healthy. There's a, there's a problem there, right? Like, like that's, <laughs> there's an issue there. So I won't keep ranting about it, but I just wanted to bring it up because I think it was one part of the film where I was like, that undercurrent always bothers me when I see it. <laughs> yeah, that's think, a great point. I, I do think that what you've tapped into there is, is part of an even larger issue. Um, and it's a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. – the same with that, right? Like the double-edged sword is that in uh, millennials and younger have really started to kill the stigma of psychology, of therapy, mm. of being in touch with your emotions, especially for men. Yep. And I think that this film comes along at a time where a lot of people were going, that's how my brain works. I, yeah. I couldn't put words to that. I couldn't, mm -hmm you know, actually talk about this with someone, mm -hmm. this film is now becoming somewat of a ther therapist to me or a therapy session to me because, yeah. you know, like OG says like, Oh, I saw myself in this. Yeah, right. And like, it explained it to me in a way that was really either helpful or I felt seen or whatever the case might be. The problem with that is that on the other side, I'm afraid that people will look at this film and be like, well, that's how every, everybody's brain works and we had that discussion of depending on your you know who you are where you've been your life experience yep. it's not always like this right. in the same way that all of a sudden people know all the terminology the therapists know and all of a sudden everybody's <laughs> gaslighting everybody <laughs> you know like right. um what does yeah. it even mean anymore exactly. so uh, there's a double-edged sword there i think that this film brings up a lot of great points that at a it's coming out at a point in time both the first one and the second one, where I think it couldn't have come out 30 years ago and have been nearly as successful as it has. Mm. Uh, people weren't ready for it. And I think that if it came out 20 years from now, we'd be like, yeah, we're already past this. We're, we're already all in touch with our emotions. It's, it's coming out at the right time where it's really hitting a popular zeitgeist. I do worry that maybe people take it a bit too far, but I mean, you could say that with a lot of films. Yeah. I guess the hope is that you know people uh, people calm down about their self psychoanalyzations. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it, yeah. That's a, that's a really good way of saying it. Um, so I want to because we've been doing this for an hour and a half. I, I'll, I there's so much we could talk about. Right, there's like so many ways we could take this conversation. But rather than do that, what are your final thoughts on this film? And um, give give me some uh, give me some insights into. Maybe even, maybe even if you're willing, if you're willing um, to be a little vulnerable, say one of the, some of the emotions that you connected to along the way, because you, you've already said, OG, that you really connected with the anxiety portion yeah. of this, um, and how the how the film actually impacted you from that from that perspective. And you can you can start us off, OG, since you've already talked about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I've always suffered from anxiety. It's been a, th a thing for me for a long, long time, and so it was kind of cool to. In, in a weird way, cool, I guess, relatable, I guess is a better term uh, to kind of see it like visualized in this way, mm -hmm. you know, it made sense, you know, and how anxiety, <clears throat> when you have that disorder, it really does take over your brain. You know what I'm saying? So it, it takes over the whole system, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it affects everything to the point where you even get like physical symptoms and things like that. So it really does take over and it can be scary. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that was kind of cool how they, how they, how they took that, they, that concept and they, vi and they, and they, and they made it like a visual 
Like you, that, now they, they made it into like a visual piece. Now I can visualize how this whole thing works. Mm-hmm. And I thought they've done it in a brilliant way. So I do think like, yeah, if you're like me and you, and you struggle with anxiety or panic attacks and things like that, I think you might get a little more out of this because, oh, wow, I can kind of see, I can kind of mm-hmm. see myself in this, you know, it's a little bit relatable, right? So I thought it was really, really cool. Um, in terms of the other emotions, obviously I'm a human being. I feel all the other ones as well. But that was the one thing for me in this particular movie that stuck out for me the most. Yeah, I thought that was cool. just, I think they handled it really well. And I will have to say too, I like the look of anxiety. She kind of has like, I don't know, you're you're an older millennial. Jay, you probably remember the show Fraggle Rock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's sure. rocking the Fraggle <laughs> Rock look to it. Like that's, to- <laughs> like she could live in that universe 100%. Yeah. A couple, a couple of things I'll pick up really quick on there. Um, one, I really liked how when she put one of the memories in the water, the memory was kind of had like a squiggle through it because yeah. anxiety has anxiety has a um, a feeling of being jittery to it. Yes, and that and it was a visual representation of what that looked like. Like, like oh, I can I, my nerve feels like that when I'm having that experience, right? A hundred percent. And yeah. even like when anxiety was at the control panel and stuff, there's yeah. like little cues there where like, she's like sipping coffee, like relentlessly. Yeah. Which is kind of like, Which is not helping by the way. No, not at coffee all, doesn't no. help. Yeah. Um, what was, uh, what is Miss Hawk's first name? I cannot think of her first name. Maya Hawk? Mia? Maya, yeah, Maya. Maya. She did a phenomenal job. Oh yeah, outstanding job. Um, and on the back of Stranger Things, uh, she's she's definitely going to be a rising star. Josh, what do you think? Any any emotions that you were connecting to, particularly in this film? Uh, from this film, I mean, I would say that like a lot of times I suffer from embarrassment. Mm. Um, I am constantly feeling like you know people are watching, and I. Um, you know what what did i do wrong uh kind of thing and it's i feel like it's less anxiety driven and more of like being uncomfortable in my own shoes at times um so as far as that i mean i connect with that character kind of along the same lines that og said i wish there was a little bit more uh to him than than what we see but uh, you know, for me, that kind of imposter syndrome comes from embarrassment, maybe a little bit of of fear as well. Um, and I really, even in the first film, really did connect a lot with fear um, mm. because that does kind of drive me a bit. I, I've 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 already select an emotion that was heading the console. It would probably be fear mm. on my end. Um, but I really enjoyed this film. I, I do wish they explored some of the emotions a little bit more. Um, I, I think I came off a bit harsh on this film, but I really did enjoy it. Um, I think that the gag with you know nostalgia kind of being pushed away here and there is also really funny. Um, again, you could explore that more, but I think that's a whole other topic for a whole different time, so let's just push it to the side, which is fun. Um, but I really thought like, the expansion from the first film to the second film did really work. I don't think it's as great as the first film, but as a, as a set, like if I were to sit down like Megan did and watch them in one block, I would not be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you know, I, you, you brought up fear, Josh. It was kind of interesting too throughout the film because fear and anxiety work together very much, right? I yeah. mean, like hand in hand. You'll and notice, too, you know, like those two kind of go together. They go together, right? And you can see like in this film, you'll notice fear will kind of chime in and be like, anxiety has a plan. Anxiety yeah. has a plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it was kind of those like little like cues sure. to kind of like kind of link those two together, which I thought was really, really creative. And they, they actually separated yeah, them very clearly. Yeah. also, you know, paired yep. up quite a bit too. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Really, really artfully done in that regard. Um, by the way, I think there would be a really fascinating. Yeah, I, I have to concur. Oh, go ahead, Megan. Are you on a delay, Megan? I think she's on a delay. Megan's on a little bit of a delay. Um, I'll, uh, so really quickly before I come to Maybe you, Megan. Maybe a little bit. Can you guys hear yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we go. can. <laughs> it's just like a little bit of a delay. Um, really quickly, I think would, there's a really interesting film to be made here of Riley a few more years into high school and seeing the mean girls 
and what their what emotions are driving them. Those are very complex because you would assume that envy and that disgust are driving their behavior, but realistically, it's a different person driving their behavior uh, or different emotion that's driving their behavior that's causing that to show up. So that would be a really, really fascinating sort of track to take with that. But anyways, I'm sorry. Megan, what, what are your final thoughts on this film and how did it speak to your emotional state? I'm, I'm right there with you. I would love the Mean Girl Inside Out crossover. That would be a fantastic comedy. Um, the uh, Yeah, I have to concur um, mostly with what everybody else has already said and what we already talked about earlier. I really enjoyed watching both of these movies back to back. I'm so glad that I, that I finally got to it. And I'm kicking myself for waiting for so long. Um, but they're they're wonderful films, um, but I do concur. I I think the first one is is the superior film. I think the second one is less impactful. Um, I think some of the more poignant moments of the first one uh, hit a lot harder than the poignant moments of the second one. Uh, that being said, the second one does still it it still feels like a home run to me. Um, like. The, the thing that really hit me really hard, in addition to like the I've got to put on a front and pretend I don't like the things that I actually like so that I can fit in with other people or so that I don't get judged. Um, the thing that really hit hit hardest was the, the thought of I'm not good enough. And I think that that's something that not only myself, but a lot of other people, um, that reoccurring thought and that thought on a loop um is something that uh, a lot of people can resonate with and i think this movie really captured how that can feel for a lot of people um so i i really enjoyed that and i know we were talking a little bit about um how emotions aren't necessarily the only thing that and and your emotional ties to memories aren't necessarily the only thing that make up your personhood um you know there's still like your rational thought processes mm -hmm. and how you can act one way in spite of how you're feeling. Um, and the movie doesn't really engage with that sort of aspect of being alive and being human, mm -hmm. but it is, a, I, I'm willing to give it grace there because it is a story about your emotions specifically, mm -hmm. not necessarily how your brain can act in spite of those emotions. So I'm willing to give it grace in that regard. Um, I do still wish that this had a little bit more to do and that, again, we could have displayed some of the positive notes um, in regards to anxiety and how that can be channeled for good and used to protect Riley. Um, in, you know, I, I, I think the movie is very effective in what it was trying to do and what it was trying to say in regards to anxiety. But I do think it could have touched on some of the positives as well a little bit more. Um, yeah, but as far as how I feel about the, the movies as a whole, um, I really like how effective they were. And just in terms of how it makes me think about my own journey into self-actualization as an adult and how my emotions have played different roles throughout my life. Like, there's definitely a time in my life where joy was was the one uh, at the at the head of the console. And there was definitely a time where sadness was the one that was there for a little while. And I think uh, for a good long time, you might not <laughs> guess this just chit chatting with me now, but anger was the one at the head of the console for a good chunk of my like, you know, teenage years and growing up through college, I would say anger was probably the one at the head of the console and becoming an adult and learning to be like, hey, hey, buddy, maybe maybe you want to move over. And like, there's a time and a place for you, but like, maybe you shouldn't be the one driving all of the time. Um, <laughs> and learning learning to let that little guy step aside and let somebody else drive for a little while, I, I think was a very important life lesson uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how, like me becoming an adult. So uh, watching, watching this movie, like give, names and faces to all of these different emotions and to be able to visualize your own life and your own memories in that same way is something 
uh, again, I find very charming and something I have very much enjoyed uh, from a movie going <laughs> as a movie going audience member. You know, you know, one criticism I do have of the movie, though, and this is a, a slight nitpick, but like I it kind of bugged me a little bit when she was kind of faking it to fit in with those girls. Right. Mm. Yes, there were consequences of faking it with her with her with her friends, the two the two other girls, right? But I feel like like the new girls that she was trying like the Firehawks that she was trying to impress, there was never any kind of pushback from them. Like I kind of would have liked to seen a little bit more conflict there where they were like, Oh man, you're kinda Oh man, she's like, so fake. Yeah. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Where where she sort of like they noticed it. You know what I'm saying? We never got that. They kind of like, oh, yeah. ha ha, yeah, Riley. Like that whole scene where she's on the couch mm -hmm. and then she likes that group, but then she does like a 180 and like, oh, now I'm like being sarcastic. They don't question that at all. And the friends are right there. Like we just went to the concert and none of them <laughs> even ask questions or like, well, wait a minute, what happened here? You know? Nobody's, nobody makes fun of her for it of like, oh, we knew it. I, I guess the idea there is that they're aware of what she's doing and they're either talking about it behind her back and being mean about it in a different way, or they're the mature ones who recognize what she's doing, but aren't saying anything because, you know, they're cognizant of it. Um, I, I do concur. I do think that there should have been more consequences for Riley's bad behavior. Uh, most important of which she shouldn't have gotten up. She shouldn't have made the team. Like mm. uh, I, the, the heavy implication at the end of the movie is that she somehow made the team in spite of all of her bad behavior and not being a good team player. I do not think she should have gotten to, and granted the movie didn't outright say it, it could have been something else, but that was the heavy implication. I don't think right. she should have been rewarded uh, for, for making the team. I think she should have not made the team and then, you know, and, and she, she gives some lip service to that of like, oh yeah, it, it's always next year. But I really think in order to actually make that lesson hit home, I think she need to she needed to have not made the team her freshman year. Mm, that's a good point. That's a great I point. Agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the ending of Hotel Transylvania 2, uh, <laughs> where the big conflict of like, oh, is this kid going to be a vampire or, or a human? And the movie tries to have its cake and eat it too. I won't go into mm. details for that movie, but I was very very frustrated with that movie for being like here's the thing that i'm saying is the message versus what's actually the message of by what's happening on screen i feel like we got a little bit of that see, at the, see now at the end of inside out too now i'm really curious jay so now we have to do a story geeks on hell hill transylvania too yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly that's no, next, next. The on the story geeks um do it yeah, I think I think uh, we were. I think Josh, were you and I talking about this? I don't know if I was talking about this with you or somebody else, but um, it's almost a joke how American cinema, and it's very true of American cinema, not as true of other uh, nations' cinemas. Although, although uh, Bollywood, it's pretty true about too, is that everything has to work out good. We don't we don't want to let audiences leave the theater without. Yeah. There are certain genres like horror where you can get away with like more of a tragic kind of like horrific outcome sometimes. yeah yeah sometimes I, I, but, and i think that that is a, a more recent development right in recent mm -hmm. years again that goes back to the pol politics and social issues and things like that that you know people want to feel good mm -hmm. at the end of something and we we've trained people in that way too um yes i won't go too in depth in depth on this i'm i'm a pro wrestling fan and um one of the recent shows that happened one of the recent big shows that happened uh the good guy lost mm. and not only did he lose but like this whole team of bad guys basically gang warfared him and a bunch of other people and like to the point where the entire arena was silent like there was no, no cheering there was no booing people were just silent and there was like this huge argument online of is this good and there were a lot of people who said, I I'm never going to buy one of these pay-per-views. I'm never going to watch again because they let me down. And it's like, they didn't let you down. They're telling a story. Right. You just happen to be in the part of the story that is conflicting. And there's a large crisis mm -hmm. and let it work itself out. Um, and I think that even in that case, even if it was the end, 
you know, sometimes those are the endings that give us the most meaning and impact. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just on, I was just doing a show on rings of power with um, our friend, Megan, uh, Michael Young, nerd soul. And uh, I love that guy. And um, he was, we were talking about, uh, we were talking about tragedy and we were talking about, I was talking about how I'm so tired of hero's journey stories because the hero's journey story is, even if you go back into the Joseph Campbell um, understanding of what myth was and what myth went, meant, it's really a coming of age story that has a time and place. But we tend to use the hero's journey as like anybody's story at any time. And it's, and it's become almost like a joke that it has to be like we, we work for our own, our own redemption and we get our own redemption and, and then life is good. That's not how life is. <laughs> that's not right. how life works. Um, sometimes that happens and that's great. Sometimes life is horrific and you have to deal with it. And there's intense grief to be, to be had. And, there's, and redemption doesn't look the same as it does when you, when you accomplish your own thing, right? Um, and so I, 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 I actually think, Megan, you're, you're right on. And I actually um, wish we would have more stories that, that did end in tragic ways, right? So we could juxtapose some things and go like, oh yeah, that's why in life sometimes things don't work out. Interestingly enough, I'll use it to connect to my emotional experience with it. I grew up in an environment where um, it's really, really interesting. You're going to get a little psychoanalysis of Jay here. Um, my dad is, is like very emotional and my mom was very much quick to be able to shut off any sort of emotion, which is, which is, you know, I don't want to stereotype anybody, but it is a little bit of a reversal of the genders in some ways, um, stereotypically speaking. Not for everyone out there. If you didn't fit that groove, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just saying my mom did not fit the normal stereotype. Cancel and, Jay. Cancel Jay. <laughs> yeah, can, cancel me. Cancel me. Um, and I, I kind of watched uh, – I didn't know this as a child. I didn't know that this was what I was doing. But I was watching my dad handle a situation and watching my mom handle a situation. And I was going, oh, if I have to choose, I will choose to shut off emotion because that is clearly not becoming a, a impediment to my daily life, right? I would see my dad break down and cry. I would see him and I would go like, but now he's being ineffective because he's crying now and he's not actually acting and he's not doing these other things. And I – and – I took that on and I was, and I'm super effective at it. If you ask me at any point in time that I, at any point in time I might be experiencing an emotion, if you look at me and go, are, are you going to cry? I can be like, no. And I can just shut it off. Like, no problem. I can just shut it off. Um, and it wasn't until much later in life that I realized that there are, there, and I think, I think Inside Out 2 gets at this a little bit when anxiety is taking over. Um, there are unintended there are unintended consequences of shutting off your emotion because what happens is is that it, for me it was a lot of physical response i would get a migraine or i would uh i would i would injure myself or or wh whatever and, and, I, and it took me a really long time to understand that i was experiencing an emotion i was saying that's not acceptable and i was continuing to move forward instead of dealing with that emotion and my body would have to tell me no, you, you, bro, you, you don't get it. Like yeah. if you're, if you're not going to understand it up here, then you're going to understand it here. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it took me a really long time to understand that. And now that I understand it a little bit That's better, how get ulcers. yeah, it is, it is really, it, is, it totally is. Or, or, it's, or, or in my case, it's how people herniate discs, ruin knees, <laughs> you know, like, like the whole thing. Um, and it took me a really long time and, and to understand it. What's interesting to me now as I experience, so ever since I've had this um, post-COVID, uh, mine was a vaccine injury, but it's post-COVID syndrome symptoms. I, had, I, get, I get these flare-ups and, and literally they won't insure me. They won't give me any more life insurance because they're like, you, you might die, brother. <laughs> and like, so you're, on the chance of like whether or not we're willing to invest in you, <laughs> we're not. Like you, you're not going to get any more life insurance. Um, and I get these flare ups and it causes these weird things to happen in my heart. And it, and it causes me to kind of, and it, it's really difficult for me not to experience anxiety around it. It's very, because it's like, I've never had that experience before, before I got the vaccines, I was 
and I know, and I know it was the vaccines just because I hadn't had COVID yet. So uh, I don't. I'm not. This is not me giving you a moratorium on <laughs> whether or not you should get it. I'm not saying any of those things. This is not political. It's just my lived experience. I was never had a heart problem in my entire life. I never had. A, I never had any health problems really that I needed to worry about besides the stupid injuries I got from not dealing with my emotions. But but ever since then, there's this like. It's like a daily. It's like a daily thing of like having. Not every day, but a lot of days where I'm like, man, there's a little bit of anxiety in the back of my head that I don't feel good today. And what am I and how is that going to play itself out and in, in how and how the day goes? And so I think seeing a movie like this where you're able to see like, yeah, there's that there's oh, there's fear. And then there's anxiety. Oh, and then there's this other thing over here that I'm experiencing instead. Maybe it's like it's disgust or maybe it's embarrassment or whatever it is. Um, I think it, I think it's really, really powerful. And I think that my end conclusion about this film is to see a filmmaker say, I'm going to be audacious in what I'm going to put on, on the screen. And the story I'm going to tell about it is going to be uh, real but also somewhat fantastical and yet it's going to be able to speak to uh the actual lived experience of other humans that is what you dream of being able to do as a filmmaker <laughs> so to be able to do that and to be able to hit a home run with it is a remarkable thing so i, I just have a huge respect for pete doctor in being able to bring those things to the screen um and, and the whole Pixar team. Times now. I know. I know the guy's a hit maker. It's, it's insane. Well, um, well, if he could turn, if he can make a story about an old, an elderly man and a, and a Boy Scout in a flying house. Yeah. If he can make that work. <laughs> well, and, and, I, I mean, and I'll, I'll say the, the, I mean, okay, so that story, I don't know that there's a better eight minutes in cinema history than the married life sequence. From oh, that. yeah. I mean, that is its own. That is, if you if that were a short film, it would be like yeah. give it the Oscar. Like, come on, like there's, and, and and so I think that yeah, he has this ability to understand what emotions are and how people experience them, and then turn that into something that is uh, really truly pretty amazing. So uh, hats off to Pete Doctor. Um, we'll go ahead and end it there because we've been talking about this movie for almost as long as the film is, <laughs> I think. Mm. Uh, and we could, and we could go for another two hours if we wanted to. Um, but OG, where can people find you? Well, Jay, Meg, Megan and Josh, awesome talking shop with you as always really, really fun time. Thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, talking some inside out with us. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can find me on, uh, you can find me on X. I'm not active really that much anymore on there. I use it mostly for like a DM machine to plan shows. That's pretty much it, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and, and sometimes, you know, you know, Seymour will send some funny stuff and I'll, I'll chuckle and, you know, but, um, so we, so I'm on X orange girl 55, but I'm trying the blue sky thing. Cause it feels like old school Twitter, you know? Mm. Um, so I'm new to that. So if you want to follow me there, you can uh, on Blue Sky at Orange Grove 55. And I'm also on Instagram, Orange Grove 55. And your corgi behind you has zero anxiety. No, zero. This is, this is him showing disgust that I'm still in the show and, have, <laughs> and I'm not playing with him. <laughs> I, I love it. Is that how he usually sleeps? Just like paws up and just on his back like that? He No, he sleeps every which way you can sleep, man. He's like, he'll he'll change positions like 10 times during the course of one podcast. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, th thanks, OG. Um, you can also find OG right here on Orange Drew 55 because he's, yeah. like he said, we, we, before the, the show started, he said, I've been doing shows on my lunch breaks. This is guy is the hardest working man in the Diz Twitter sphere. <laughs> so you got to you got to check out his shows. Uh, OG is really good at breaking down Disney news, bringing on people who are really insightful to talk about what's going on at the Walt Disney Company and making sense of things that are OG won't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this. OG makes sense of a world where most people have an agenda and are trying to get you to believe something that is completely untrue. OG is here to give you the truth. So thank you for that, OG. Uh, OG55 is here for that. Uh, Josh, um, tell the people where they can find you. Yeah. I mean, the main thing, if you want to check out the YouTube channel, uh, it's youtube.com slash modern mouse. Um, if you're interested, I mean, I've got the animated 100 list that I'm going through. So if you're into animation and not just Disney, but any animation from all around the world, 
Uh, I'm going through them all the way back to the earliest animated film in existence from the 1920s uh, or 19, I think early 20s. Yeah, uh, all the way up to modern day. Uh, I also do a lot of video essays. Uh, so I have a whole series on that. It's a lot of fun. I talk about how like the Muppets were influenced by drug culture or um, how there's never been a good adaptation of Pinocchio and why. Uh, things like that. So I try and and take some interesting topics and put put 20 minutes of my own willpower into editing something fun together. Uh, you could also follow me on X or on Instagram, like OGM more probably on Instagram these days than on X, uh, which is Modern Mouse Josh. And um, you can DM me, hang out, chat with me, whatever you'd like there. Can we can we can we say that Josh has some of the best Muppets content on YouTube? Come on, oh, let's, yeah. just, let's just admit it. <laughs> Absolutely. And when he when he just mentioned that it was it heavily influenced by drug culture, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh megan uh it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. It's been way too long since we did a podcast together. Thanks for coming on. Um, tell the folks where they can find you. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the Menguin. That's T H E M E N G U I N. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel called Silver Screams, where my roommate and I talk about horror things. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm also not on social media as much anymore. I basically use my Twitter to just retweet fan art of horror things that I like or video games that I like. Oh. Um, so so hit that up if you're if you're looking for some spoopy or shippy fan art of horror properties. Um, but yeah, uh, so I'm a little bit more active on Instagram these days. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks again for having me. This was such a treat. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. And I have, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a teaser announcement here. Um, we are doing two uh, SoCal uh, special screenings of No Vacancy coming in December. I want to let you know about that because I'm going to be coming out to Southern California and then we're going to be having those screenings. Um, I even may have somebody doing a, um, a host for the Q&A over here um, for that. <laughs> and maybe I will get one of the other two people down here on the bottom to be my other host for the second event. Uh, but if you guys want to come and see No Vacancy and hear us talk about it live, um, we will be doing a Q&A and stay tuned because I will give out more details about where we're doing those and how you can get tickets to um, come join us for that. It's going to be a really fun activity. I can't wait for you to meet the cast and crew because just like when I, when I worked with Megan on um, Death of a Bounty Hunter, when you work with people to create something that is very meaningful to you and they bring their own meaning into it, the amount of joy you will hear from us at the panel is just a, an amazing amount of joy um, in the creative process and, and what we get to do. So I hope that you guys would join us for some of those um, some of those events. I will give you more details later, but I want to get it on your radar because uh, that's probably where you'll find me because I'm not going to be on X. <laughs> I'm very rarely on Instagram. So if you want to find me, uh, come hunt me down in Southern California in December and join one of our events. But from everybody on this panel, which was a, such a fun time, um, to everybody out there, you out there, I hope you had a good time as well. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and make sure you're subscribed to Orange Grove 55.